Welcome, everyone. Uh, that's a welcome to those of us who are gathered here in Weiser Hall on the campus of the University of Michigan, as well as to those who are joining us virtually uh, over Zoom, which is uh, a, an offering that we have uh, provided uh, uh, at the uh, university for many events during the pandemic. But uh, given its success in making our programs much more accessible to people off of campus, we have elected to continue uh, uh, broadcasting our uh, sp uh, uh, talks uh, over Zoom. But it's not merely a broadcast. Uh, it is, in fact, interactive. So those of you who are joining us over Zoom can uh, pose questions to our speakers, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens. There are more people coming in. Please come in and join us. Um, my name is Benjamin Paloff. I'm the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, it is my very sincere pleasure to welcome uh, our first uh, speaker of the new uh, semester. Um, uh, Saglar Bugdayeva. Uh, it, it is an especially great pleasure because this is the most normal uh, w uh, kind of event we've had uh, for a couple of years. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to just speak with you all without a mask on and to, uh, to see so many people uh, joining us today. Uh, we have a number of uh, exciting events at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies over the course of the semester. There is a pent-up demand, frankly, for the kinds of events we've wanted to be able to offer over the last um, couple of years. Uh, so uh, those of you who were able to join us yesterday for Lech Wałęsa's uh, uh, talk um, in the Rackham Amphitheater already know that we have uh, some exciting things uh, going on. Um, just want to alert you to a couple of events that are that are uh, in the near term. Uh, this Friday, uh, just in a couple of days, uh, September 16th, from 3.30 to 5, uh, in this same space uh, in Weiser Hall, we will be having an artist roundtable for the exhibit, uh, I Have a Crisis for You, Women Artists of Ukraine Respond to War which uh, is an exhibit uh, that is already up, I believe, in Lane Hall uh, and has been curated by uh, Grace Mahoney, uh, a graduate student in Slavic Languages and Literatures, um, and Jessica Zehovich, the uh, director of Fulbright Ukraine, who is an alumna of our uh, doctoral program. Uh, next week, September 21st, Wednesday, from 5 to 6.30, also in this space, uh, in Weiser Hall, uh, we will be co-sponsoring the lecture of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia by Janine De Giovanni, who's the founder and director of the Reckoning Project, Ukraine Testifies. Uh, she will be giving a talk called Investigative Journalists and the Documentation of War Crimes. And uh, looking forward to October, we have more things, by the way, coming be between mid-September and October, but just looking forward uh, among some of the highlights. Uh, Wednesday, October 12th, uh, our next crease noon lecture uh, will be held on the fifth floor of Weiser Hall. And uh, the speaker is Alexander Boskovich, uh, who is lecturer in Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian at Columbia University. Uh, he is also an, alum, uh, an alumnus of uh, the PhD program in Slavic languages and literatures here. So that's just a few things that are coming up. Uh, now moving to today's event, our speaker we're very excited to have uh, is Saglar or Saga uh, Bugdayeva, who was born and raised in Kalmykia. Uh, central to um, Professor Bugdayeva's work as a scholar, uh, of, the Eura of Eurasian studies is a commitment to identifying and preserving the nomadic oral and written heritage of the great Eurasian steppe. Uh, before receiving her doctorate in sociology from Yale, um, Professor Bugdayeva studied Mongolian, Tibetan, and Mandarin linguistics at St. Petersburg uh, State University. 
uh, her talk today uh, will uh, be on uh, Jangar, uh, the, I think we have the title, Nomads, Aesthetic, and Literature, um, uh, and some quintessential questions about uh, uh, movement and representing movement across the Great Steppe. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Bugdayeva. Thank you. Make sure that it works. Okay. So today I will talk about Jangar, the heroic epic of the Kalmyk nomads. So my um, the main, uh, the main, the keywords for my presentation are the people, the nomads, aesthetic, and literature. About nomads, I'm going to use the Kalmyk case study. Uh, there are a lot of studies about the Silk Road. And I have some issues with that. Why do we call the Silk Road the Silk Road? What about the horses? What about the nomads? And historically, this population, this area, this territory, this knowledge has been controlled by two sides. So we have the Beijing Wall on one side, and we have the Berlin Wall, wall on the other side, right? So the Russian narrative spreads all the way to the Berlin Wall. The Chinese narrative spreads all the way to the Beijing Wall. So when I study, do my research, present, I want to make an emphasis on the missing part of this Silk Road. I don't call it the Silk Road. In my book, I call it the Great Eurasian Step Road. So the emphasis on the road of the steppe, the emphasis on the relationship of the people who live along this Eurasian steppe road with the steppe, with the animals, with the ecosystem of the steppe. There's a narrative from Moscow saying that, oh, the Kalmyks and nomads, they came here only on the in the 17th century. There is another narrative from Beijing saying, oh, these nomads are barbaric. They don't know how to write. They don't know what is literature. So I think it's time to reconsider two narratives from two centers. So when we study or when we investigate the issues of the great Eurasian step road, we ask ourselves, Whose narrative do we use? Are they, do they come from Moscow or do they come from Beijing? And I do not mean the people. What the Kalmyk nomads learn from their travels, being nomadic, that it's not about people. I would ne never say anything against the people. It's about the regime. It's about the control. It's about who makes the decisions, right? So right away, if you talk about Jungar, it's about literature. So what is the definition of literature? What is the narrative behind literature making, right? So in my studies, I, I dedicate my book to my father. And my father was um, sent to Siberia, Gulag. The entire people, the entire nation of the Kalmyks, one day was sent to Siberia by Stalin. So my father told me when he dropped me at St. Petersburg State University to study, he said, invest every penny in your education. Because they will take away your job, they will take away your house, but they cannot take away your knowledge. 
you move with that knowledge as a nomad. So, literature, it's about knowledge. Literature, for nomads, it's about information. Literature is about communication and about the transmission of that information. So when we talk about the nation building or the nation, uh, the modern concept of nation, we, forgot, we forget about the nation destruction. What is literature when your nation is completely destructed? The concept of nation is based on what is your contribution as a nation, right? Do you have a literature? Do you have a sovereignty? Do you have a sovereign literature? And the nomads did. But we have an impression that nomads do not, do not know how to write, that the nomads do not know how to create their sovereign states. And why do we need to read? The books like Jungar, the epics from the great Eurasian step road. Because it breaks the narratives that come from Moscow, that come from Beijing. That nomads do not know how to write. That nomads do not know how to create the sovereign states. They, that they don't have their own agency. So, in my presentation, I talk about Jungar as literature. And it's about extraordinary human transformations from the heroic age. Right away, there is an issue. Time of the creation of this epic. So if you look at the Russian scholarship, they would tell you the epic was created in the 16th, 17th century. But if you investigate deeper, you will learn that there were great Russian scholars who were sent to Gulag, sent to Siberia, for their dedication to the scholarship saying that this is a great piece of literature. And perhaps it was developed uh, during the heroic age. And we will get to this point. So what is Jungar? So, Jungar is about this magical country, a magical place. The name of this place is called Bumba. And Bumba is the idea of collective being. And also Bumba is the union of nomadic kingdoms. So what is interesting about this particular type of literature, that it's not linear. Because if you imagine yourself as a nomadic state in a linear transmission of information, then it means that nomads are supposed to die. That nomads do not, uh, should not culturally survive in the modern age. So, in imagination of Jungar, it's not a linear collective being. In that imagination is, is a, a cyclical collective being. So it's, there is some kind of hope if you, if you, if your hamates, kingdoms, states, empires uh, begin and then develop and then fall, that there is a hope that, that it will continue. So, so the, the stories, the narrative behind the epic is sort of a cyclical 
narrative. So it's about a hero. Each, each chapter, each cycle, it's about a heroic deed of one hero. And um, in every cycle, a hero begins and ends his heroic deed in the boomba, dining, feast, banquet hall, with drinking, feasting, and merrymaking. Because you know, if nomads know that their lives is short. So you have to invest in your knowledge, information, education, and you have to enjoy life. So it's a lot about merrymaking. There is no strict order of cycles. So um, I translated 10 cycles, um, but there are many of cycles sort of spread out, some lost, some hidden, some to be discovered um, along the great Eurasian step road. So there is no strict order of cycles, um, but there is one foundational prologue. It's almost like having a um, uh, like binge watching Netflix, right? So you can watch all these episodes once in a row. And um, so before every episode, you, you're supposed to use a, um, a prologue. And in a prologue, it sort of captures the, the main narrative, right? It's about the, uh, the union of uh, 70 Hanates. It's about the king and the queen. And the uh, the uh, and the and uh, and heroes. So uh, the book, uh, the translation of the book is based on ten songs performed by the famous Kalmyk uh, rhapsodist, and his name is Elian Ovla. He lived in 1857 to 1920. He was born into a line of uh, Jangar Chi, the singers of Jangar, stretching back over centuries. So, so the epic is characterized by alliteration. And uh, it's uh, when the emphasis goes not at the end of the uh, line, but in the beginning. So I didn't capture this in my translation because um, yeah, you need to you need to come up with the with, uh, with the words that would start on the same letter, right? So uh, so it would sound something like sovereign Han Jagger, striking with his looks like a moon, silk woven um, woven robes were chosen for him, stitched by selected highborn queens, sewn but only by his wife, sixteen year old Hatun armed with her scissors, signature robes of hers made only for her loving Han. So the emphasis goes on the first, um, first letter, S. And of course, because it's an epic, it's a heroic epic, and it's from the heroic age, the emphasis is on heroes and their heroic deed. So there are different heroes. So each chapter or each cycle is dedicated to one heroic deed. So the most famous is Scarlet Lion Hangor. And he's famous for his bravery. So Shaman Golden Heart is famous for his wisdom. Sirius Sanal for his, he's a philosopher, he likes to contemplate. So this is his heroic cultural feature of his character. Handsome in the end, he is the beautiful, the most handsome man you can imagine. Mediator Jilgan, he's, he, he is known for his diplomacy. So hero's names are determined by the moment of the heroic deed. And that heroic deed doesn't need to be necessarily in, in the middle of the war. It can be your particular professional achievement, right? If you build uh, a beautiful palace, your name will be dedicated to that, right? 
uh, the um, a person who um, who translated um, who discovered who discovered Elam of La and recorded uh, ten cycles and then um, defended his thesis at St. Petersburg University saying that this is not just individual songs, this is a real epic. Um, this is uh, an epic literature in its entirety. So, so Namto um, is, is his second name. So he was born and when you are, when you are born, uh, parents give you some some names like uh, uh, Namto's name was a dog, and then when he um, um, had his heroic deed, like he he um, uh, he brought the epic um, into uh, Saint Petersburg scholarship. So uh, people started to call him the scholar, Namto the scholar. So. Scarlet Lion Hangor, Handsome Mingyan, Shaman Golden Heart, these are the names that are usually given to heroes for their heroic deed. So heroes' names are determined by the moment of their heroic deed. So for example, uh, one of the most uh, popular characters, Scarlet Lion Hangor, he is very shy and uh, and he, at the same time, is the bravest man in the universe. A roaring lion sleeps in his ribcage. So when the moment comes for him to protect the Boomba Union, hunger transforms into a fearless lion. And it it's also has um, some description uh, of hunger. So hunger is also associated with different shades of bright red color. So in his heroic moments, he turns from a human into the um, spirit of lion. So his hair becomes red. Um, so his lion spirit shines with ecstatic scarlet sunbeams. So even in, when he's not in his heroic moments in, uh, in, um, in everyday life, hunger can be recognized from far away because of his hair, so um, he always has trouble to keep his hair um, groomed. And uh, his hair always looks like a lion's ma mane. So Jungar is mostly about humanity. It's about love, how to maintain your humanity, how to maintain your love, despite all the um, um, wars and um, unfortunate events. So it's, it's also, it's, so the love is about mother's love to her son, father's love to his daughter, um, the love between two friends, so, um, and that, that's one of the reasons I wanted to translate this book because I felt that uh, what we know about, um, about the Eurasian nomads, that part is missing, their humanity. So when I read um, old historical documents, it's about love. Um, if you read Janger, it's about uh, the king father who loves his daughter so much, he doesn't want her to get married. He wants her to do anything she wants to do. But we need this, this humanity, vulnerability, and love um, that nomads just love their daughters. Nomads just love their sons, and they, um, they, they have this um, human, hu human feelings. So, so the main, the main, um, the main um, character is Jungar. So he's the leader of uh, of this uh, of this 
country, Bumba. And his, uh, his best friend is hunger. And we know everybody, um, everybody likes this character, hunger, who looks like a, a, a lion. But what makes Janger uh, the leader among, uh, em among equals, right? Um, what makes Janger, rather than hunger, a leader among all the signs of competing families is his virtuous character. So, um, so all heroes are equal. All of them are um, heroes, and, uh, but they all agree that Janger should be the leader. So Janger's name denotes one who lives by ethics or by honor and reflects his call to lead. So living by honor is what holds the union of equal kingdoms together and makes this union of equal kingdoms invincible. So, so this epic is the Kalmyk literature. So who are the Kalmyks? So they live, everybody thinks that it's somewhere uh, in Asia, but Kalmyks live in the south, on the European part of Russia. So if you imagine the um, Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, it's somewhere in the middle. And it's also the former territory of the um, Golden Horde. So the capital of the Golden Horde, Sarai, with its, its magnificent architecture has long been covered by the sands of the great Eurasian step, by the sands of time. But the Kalmyk nomads have managed to preserve the great treasure of their heritage. And they carefully transmitted this, this heritage from generation to generation. So uh, that's how they used to write. So this is the script that goes from top to bottom. Um, so in medieval and early modern times, Kalmyks were known as Oirats. So in Jangar, Bumba as a union of kingdoms mirrors the union of Oirat Hanates. And this is um, the maps of the Kalmyks. Um, from the 18th century. So, um, so if you think about the Oirats, the Oirats had a union of kingdoms. So one of them was uh, the Kalmyk kingdom on the Volga ri uh, river, and another was the Jungar Hanate or Jungar kingdom. And um, so this is, um, this, is an, uh, this map is, um, was, uh, was prepared by the French um, cartographer Guilleme in 1706. And this map uh, was, um, uh, was, br uh, was brought from the Jungar kingdom, Hanate, to Europe by, by Johann Gustav Renat. And uh, so if you think about Marco Polo, and the uh, and Kublai Khan, so um, Renat would be Marco Polo of the 18th century. Uh, Marco Polo of the 18th century, from who traveled to the Jungar um, Jungar Kingdom and um, and had a similar similar experience um, uh, as uh, Marco Polo with Kublai Khan. Um, similar experience between um, Johann Gustav Renat and the Jungar Hans. So, um, so the um, 
So we know about Kalmyks, they, um, they were called Oirites, right, in medieval early modern times. And then, uh, so the Oirites, um, they um, became, became um, powerful in uh, 1407, um, uh, they became powerful in the 15th century uh, after the fall of the Mongol dynasty in China. So the Oirats consolidated power under the talented commander Essen, who would lead them to dominate the Eurasian steppe road. So the Oirats' last large territorial expansion took place in the 17th, 18th centuries, uh, where the realm covered vast expanses of inner Eurasia from the Caspian Sea to Tibet uh, and Western Siberia and East Turkestan, which is now Xinjiang in China. But as we learned from the epic, the center of Oirat culture was the Altai Mountains, the mountains of gold. And we learn uh, also from the secret history of, um, of uh, the Mongols um, written uh, around 1240 that, um, that uh, the history of words dramatically changed during the time of Genghis Khan in 1207 when Genghis Khan recognized the significance of the Oirat cultural heritage, decided to marry his uh, two daughters to uh, sons of the Oirat prince, Oirat uh, leader, Huduka Beki. So, and because of this, um, this um, marital um, Union, the Oirats joined the army of Chinggis Khan's son, Juchi, in his European expansion and the establishment of Juchi's kingdom on the Volga River. We can also learn about the Oirats from uh, Juvaini, a historian at the Mongol court of northern Persia. He said, in the 13th century that the Oirats are one of the best known of the Mongol tribes. And to that tribe belong most of the maternal uncles of the children and grandchildren of Chinggis Khan. The reason being that at the time of his first rise to power, the Oirats came forward to support and assist him. Um, and also an edict was issued concerning that that tribe of Oirats uh, that the daughters uh, of uh, their khans should be married to the descendants of Genghis Khan. So, and we see the importance of women and the importance of uh, mothers and wives uh, from, um, from, the, um, fr from literature. So in the epic, um, you, you can often see these statements from people. They would say, who is the mother who gave birth to such a hero? Who is the mare that folds such a hero horse? So nobody says, who is the father? It's always about who is the mother of a hero. <laughs> um, and of course, if you talk about nomads, if you talk about empires that they establish, it would be impossible without the participation of heroic women. So this was from uh, the Book of Tra Travels by, um, by the Ottoman writer who wrote in 17th century. Warriors from Tashkent raiding the area bordering Kalmyk country captured some Kalmyk nomads. Kalmyk warriors immediately chased down and fought the Tashkent rider, raiders. After the battle, when armor and clothes were removed from the fallen Kalmyks, it was revealed that they were women. So, 
So, so the role of women should not be underestimated. So we can, we can learn from, um, again, from the secret history of the Mongols about Argina Hatun. And she was the daughter, if you remember 1207, right? The coalition between uh, the sons of uh, Chinggis Khan and uh, the, the daughters of Chinggis Khan and the sons of uh, the Oirat um, kings. So, um, so from this connection, there was uh, Argina Hatun. She was daughter of Oirat Torolchi, who was son of Hudukar Beki and um, uh, and Tsetse Khan, Chinggis Khan's daughter. So she was, so this is, uh, this is the princess from uh, the 19th century, but uh, of course I couldn't find Argina Hatun's water, but um, I think the spirit is there. <laughs> so Argina Hatun was empress of the Chagatai Hanek, and she was uh, the regent in the name of her infant son for 10 years. And we also learned about her from the secret history of the Mongols that she organized a, a banquet um, for Hulagu when his army was marching through Central Asia to Iran in 1255. So what I like about um, the epic Janger, it's, it's, about, it's about family relations it's about the father's son to his daughter. Um, so I dedicate this translation to my dad because um, having experienced this father's love, I, I always thought why, why this part is missing, right? Um, so there's a proverb, educate a boy and you will raise a hero educate a girl, and you will raise a nation. So examples of women's autonomy echo throughout the epic. So for example, in cycle two, the Council of Nobility accepts Princess Kerenzel's proposal to join Jangar's Hanait when she takes the offspring of livestock as a wedding present. And they discuss at the meeting at the council. If our princess takes their livestock offsprings to faraway lands, animals will follow the, their offspring. Owners will follow their herds. Nomads will migrate to Jangar's Hanit. Right? So don't underestimate sheep, because sheep, <laughs> behind the sheep are shepherds, right? The nomads. And it's interesting, the transformation, heroic transformation, not only among men, but also among women. So you can be a beautiful princess, and then you transform into a warrior, and that everybody afraid of you, right? So, but if you are a warrior princess, doesn't mean that you're not, that you cannot be good looking. So, Hatun was extraordinary. If she looked to the left, the radiance on her left cheek made the little fish visible in the river on the left. If she looked to the right, the radiance of her right cheek made the little fish visible in the river on the right. Her scarlet lips were brighter than blood. Her white teeth were whiter than snow. Framing elegantly on both sides, the black silk covered the braids. The silver earrings swayed on her delicate ear lobes, casting the silver rays of light on the white tenderness of her neck. If you appreciate the cute roundness of the baby camel poop, then you may grasp the value of the earring design in its shape.
Another misconception that nomads are not educated because they travel all over, they are illiterate. So, jungle was not a primitive oral tradition for illiterate nomads. It was a live artistic form that produced, rather than a static artifact, an ephemeral transmission of literary creation suitable to nomadic settings. So the epic oral transmission does not imply that nomadic audience was illiterate. Up until the destruction of the Kalmyk Khanate in 1771, Kalmyks observed laws that promoted literacy among all rich and poor men. In fact, Kalmyk public education laws and practices were not only well codified, but also more advanced than comparable laws of other many states. For example, the 1640 Civil Court of Criminal Laws, which was called Sajin Bichik, stated that if the sons of nobles were not attentive to reading and writing, a fine equal to the price of a three-year-old camel, camels are important, would be le levied against the father. In addition, commoners were required to teach their sons reading and writing uh, commensurate with opportunity and ability. So nobles assumed their own educational expenses and any collected fines were distributed to cover the educational needs of the poor. So now about the kings. What does it mean to be a king? Kings were chosen. Kings were selected based on their professionalism, uh, based on their leadership skills. So, so if you want to imagine what does it mean to be a leader among the nomads, so um, we can consider uh, the case of Ayuka the Han, Ayuka king. He was the state builder of the Kalmyk Khanate, the Kalmyk kingdom in uh, the 17th, 18th century. So the state builder, Ayuka Khan, seems to have exemplified the union of Oirat kingdoms through family coalitions and transcontinental migrations. So Ayuka Khan was a progeny of a marriage between members of two familial dynasties, one from the Kalmyk Khanate on the Volga River and the other one uh, from the Jungar Khanate, the Western Mongolia, Western China now. As a child, he traveled more than 2,000 miles from the Kalmyk Kingdom to the Jungar Kingdom to live with his maternal grandfather, Batur Huntaiji, sign of the House of Chores. All Oirats considered the House of Chores and the legendary state builders, like remember Hudukadiki, who uh, moved. Um, who moved from uh, the Yenisei River, Siberia, to the Volga River, right? SN, the 15th century, and Batur Huntachi, 17th century, to be of the divine right, right? Divine right of Hans, the sky divine right, in the process of political leadership and cultural transmission. So, Batur Huntachi's teaching about state building were not in vain. After Ayuka's return to the Volga River, the Kalmyk Khanate or Kalmyk Kingdom reached its peak under his leadership. So by 1680s, Ayuka had expanded the power and prestige of his kingdom across the Eurasian steppe. So when the Jungar Kingdom was destroyed in 1758, many Jungar families under the House of Chores migrated to the Kalmyk Kingdom strengthening their family coalitions in the Volga region. So until the Russian Revolution in 1917, the descendants of Khudukat the Key, the Tunduta dynasty from the House of Chores, were the custodians of the epic Jungar and other nomadic cultural and, and political traditions. So this, is, uh, this letter was found recently uh, by Professor Tepke from Kalmykia. So this is Ayuka Han's letter uh, from 16, 1685. So 
Let's read that letter. Let there be prosperity. Here I, Ayuka, and we are all healthy. There are you, Ivan Alexeyevich and Peter the Great, and all in good health. You, White Han, send Prince Andrei Ivanovich Galitsyn to Astrakhan in order to take an oath to each other as before and establish the friendship. We, considering it right, took an oath and established the friendship. After the oath, I sent my messengers to you three times. You agreed that we take the troops, cannons, gunpowder, lead, and money for two years from Astrakhan. In Astrakhan, they have not given the money in full, only for one year. Give us the rest of the money for one year, which we have agreed on beho before. If you consider that my words are correct, we will go on a campaign to Inushi in spring. Give us 3,000 men with 30 cannons, gunpowder, and lead. Have not we literally discussed this in the oath? The Yai Cossacks are building a city down the Yai River. Stop it. After we recapture our pastures, we will not be able to be with them anymore together. After we establish peace, we return 500 guards to Astrakhan. We have returned all the Russians captives. You have not. Bring back our Kalmyk people. We return the Aztecs. My messengers are teacher Unutoy and monk Badiochi. All together are 30 people. Send back my messengers on horseback and merchants on ships. So, let's see how much time I have. So the epic jungle, it's about love. So you will experience the love of a, of a father to his daughter. You will experience the love of two friends, right? You will experience the love of a partner, right, for life. So, so the concept of under is important. So under means sworn brotherhood. And we learn about this concept from um, from the secret history of the Mongols. I'm not going to go over um, this poem. And the same concept um, of that sworn friendship is in the epic, but also in the lives of the Kalmyks, in the real lives. So the Kalmyk national epic Jangar is intertwined with the life of Kalmykia and its own heroes. So on the left is Namto. Namto means the scholar. And he brought Jangar to the um, scholarship, right? So he defended his dissertation, his thesis, uh, proving that epic Jangar is an epic literature. So, Namto's name, Noha, means dog. He, uh, his name was associated with the animal spirit of a dog. So by finding his calling and becoming a cultural model, he earned his heroic name, Namto the scholar. Uh, and he also was a best friend of the prince, Tundutov. So, uh, so they kept this under sworn brotherhood over their short lives, or their, over their lives. So his father uh, worked for the Tundutov dynasty family. Um, so Namto Acherov was born in 1896 on the Tundutov estate. So this is the mother, remember 
they always say, who is the mother who gave birth to a hero, right? So this is a mother who gave, gave birth to uh, Tundut of Prince, the hero. So her name is Prin Princess uh, Erzata, and she raised both her son, Danzan Tundutov, and her son's friend, Namto, the scholar. And she raised them in this epic tradition of Anda, sworn brotherhood. And that Anda tradition is represented in the epic, uh, with the friendship between Jangar and Hongor. So after completing their studies in St. Petersburg, the two young men were actively involved in the cultural and political affairs of Kalmykia. Like many Kalmyks, both fought on the side of the White Army in the Russian Civil War. And following a defeat by the Red Army in 1919, a small group of Kalmyk troops and their families managed to escape on French and British ships, leaving Black Sea ports. So the two friends would last meet in a port in Crimea. Prince Danzan boarded a ship while Nomto uh, stayed behind, pointing to his abandoned comic countrymen and saying, if you're going to suffer, suffer with your people. If you're going to die, die with your people. Prince Danzan Tundutov moved to France, but couldn't find peace in exile in Paris and returned to Russia in November 1922, where he was arrested by the GPU, GPU, a forerunner of the KGB, twice, upon his arrival and later in April 1923. By the decision of the GPU, court session on, uh, on August 2nd, 1923, Prince Tundutov was sentenced to be shot. The decree was carried out on August 1923. So for many decades, until the corresponding archives were declassified, the place of execution and the place of burial remained unknown. Only recently, a group of activists found that Prince Danzan Tundutov was killed outside Yauskaya Hospital in Moscow. In his last letter before execution, he wrote, those who know how to fight know how to love and forgive. So in the middle is uh, Namto, the scholar. Here he was young. This is after being sent to Siberia. Fortunately, Prince Danzan's family had remained in France. So uh, Baron Serge Gravenitz, a descendant of the Tundutovs and of the family of Russian poet Pushkin in 2020 settled in Kalmykia and brought with him the flag of the Kal Kalmyk immigrants in Europe. Namto Achirov's niece managed to preserve through the Kalmyk deportation to Siberia in 1943, the flagpole topper of the House of Chores. The biographical accounts of scholar Namto and Prince Danzan highlight now, as uh, highlight how inspired by Jangar, and we know that Jangar means one who lives by ethics and honor. Comics repeat the scenes of friendship, love, and heroic adventures in their real life. Thank you. I'll ask if it's okay. I'll take the um, the director's privilege of asking the first question. I was wondering if you could speak um, a little bit more about uh, Kalmyk literature as a modern literature, not just as as epic uh, or say or cultural artifact, but um, 
but how, if you could speak a little bit more about how a text like this becomes part of contemporary literary circulation when it, when it seems, for example, to have no author. Mm -hmm. and, and we become fixated on the identity of the author reflected in the work. So, um, if you look at this photo, you have um, Nam To, the scholar, who, uh, who was known for his uh, knowledge of the epic. And he, um, he was deported to Siberia many times. Uh, and then uh, before he died, he, uh, he, uh, he, he was allowed to go back. So he, he lived in a small village um, in, a, in very humble settings. But you will see on the left side and on the right side, these are the intellectuals of the modern, modern day Kalmykia. So on the left side, you have Kugultinov. And Kugultinov uh, uh, is a famous uh, poet. And he was, um, he was sent to, um, he was in prison sent to Gulag for his literature, for his writing. And, uh, and he became the famous poet among the people. And why he became the famous poet among the nomads? Because nomads like their freedom. They don't like any walls. They like to roam around. And they also don't like the, 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 um, the dictatorial power of the Khans, right? It's uh, one of the reasons why it was um, not a stable system, because uh, um, people could choose uh, who they want to love as a, uh, as a leader, right? So the poet is also, you have to um, deserve the name to be the poet, right? As we know from, from, um, uh, from the scholar, Nam To, he earned the name, the scholar. Uh, he was named by the people. So his child's name is a dog. <laughs> and uh, so, so the poet on the left side also earned his name. And, and that is sort of a quintessential role of the poets, of the writers. You have the role of art, the role of, of your writing, the role of authorship. You should stand up and say the truth in the face of death. So that's what the scholar did, and that's what the poet did. So uh, he was an officer, and when the Kalmyks were deported to Siberia, you, you had a choice. Uh, if you are of a high class, you could say, oh, I'm not a Kalmyk, I'm maybe some kind of any other nationality. You can change your documents, you can maybe bribe. And he said, no, I'm not going to change my identity. And he wrote a poem, I am the Kalmyk. And because of that, he was sent to Siberia. And, um, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, so the role of um, modern writing, the role of medieval writing, the role of ancient writing among the nomads, it's you have to earn the name by the people. So there are many books, but if you don't take the role of a writer to say your truth or the truth or the only truth in the name of, of your people, um, so you are not a writer. Yeah, so he, um, so his, uh, his 
his poem um, at Pravda Yanya Trikalsa. It's, um, it's a famous poem. Hello, um, thank you for coming and speaking with us. I really enjoyed that. Um, so I do know that uh, Kalmykia is the furthest um, west um, province with Buddhism as a majority religion. Could you please speak to that and how it plays into traditions in terms of the uh, Kalmyk people and as well as the epic? Yes. Oh, I wish I had, let's see if I have the slides. I have like 50 slides. Yeah. No, no, no. That is. Um, I wish I had more time. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see if I included this. No. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, So um, when when you when you write, um, it's um, and it, it has to be in your mind, right? Uh, because um, um, because the Kalmyks were um, the Kalmyks uh, the Kalmyk polities were destroyed many times. The literature was um, destroyed, scattered. Um, so then, how can you transfer this information um, over time, right? So, uh, so the Buddhist tradition helped to um, to use um, the uh, meditative um, tools and methods to memorize, right? So it's also um, the epic has some kind of um, healing uh, effects on your mental health, right? So if your people are destroyed, how to remain sane and love and be human. Um, so uh, there is this, um, um, there is this uh, probably a Buddhist meditative approach to literature. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's similar to mandalas, right? Uh, it's a process when you create this beautiful um, mandala piece, um, piece of art uh, with sand. And then at the end, you spread, um, you, you, yeah, you use the wind and you spread the sand and uh, so, and it's uh, it's uh, it's um, it's a healing um, way of just taking um, uh, taking um, the possibility of any distraction. So um, so be prepared, uh, or, uh, and uh, the best way to prepare for any distraction is to keep everything in your mind. And the best way to uh, remain human and keep your love um, um, by developing this, uh, this ability of sort of um, mental disposition to a change. So uh, yes, Buddhism and the epic tradition, they are intertwined. And actually, um, for a long time, um, it was considered that the writing and, and Buddhism um, spread among the Mongolic speaking people uh, during Genghis Khan. But there is new uh, scholarship um, is developing right now, uh, and, uh, and they are pushing the, the timeline for uh, literature, for Buddhism, um, so the, the frames are expanding. So this is an exciting time to, to, to be in this field. 
Um, we have a question that came in over Zoom. Yes, so there are some wonderful questions um, from our Zoom audience. I would like to acknowledge them as well. Um, so we have one here from Elena, um, who thanks you so much um, for this resource, um, this presentation, um, and asks uh, if there are any other works of literature like Jangar from this era or previous time periods. Um, the Secret History of the Mongols, uh, is uh, it's a, it's a, the best one of the best uh, resources, uh, um, and uh, yeah. So my second project will be on the uh, nomadic literature from um, early medieval times all the way to the 18th, 19th century. Yeah. There is another one on the Zoom, unless someone in the live audience has another question. All right, uh, then I will proceed along um, to a, a two-part question um, from Dolma, um, who also thanks you um, for your talk um, and writes that we comics are so grateful for this important and urgent scholarship. Um, she asks, does the nomadic movement in Jangar offer us any insight for thinking about Russian cultural and economic oppression and for thinking about the increasingly diasporic community of Oirads, Buryats, and others across the world? Does honoring our histories outside national boundaries help us think about what forms of collaboration and coalition building might be necessary moving forward? Good question. <laughs> so, um, I think we can learn a lot from, uh, from Jungar because of, uh, specifically for this tradition of transmitting information and knowledge uh, through your imagination. So we know that nations, nation state, this a modern imagination, modern, um, modern invention. So uh, Jungar allows you to imagine, imagine your own collective being. So, uh, and it's, it also helps you to question certain assumptions. So, um, yeah, so I think it's time to read uh, the epic and envision your own sense of collective being or nomadic polity, nomadic culture. Are there, Are there any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Bugdaeva. It was a really wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the ways in which um, the expression of oral tradition was changed after the deportation to Siberia, because you mentioned it was like a lively artistic form. So I'm wondering about the ways in which it was able to survive after deportations. Mm -hmm. So, um so Jangar is a, it's, it's a tradition, um, and it's passed from generation to generation. And, um, so it actually trains you uh, to this um, social upheavals, right? So if your uh, people suddenly are being killed or deported, so uh, this is the best way of cultural survival. Um, they will take anything from you, you will lose your material possessions, books, right? But nobody can take your imagination. So, um, so, so Jangar is actually was a way of cultural survival in Siberia. It was uh, a way of cultural survival during the revolution. Uh, and, and it continues uh, to remain uh, a, a source, a source for, um, 
for a sense what to be one collective being or body or yeah, culture, polity. Mm -hmm. There are a couple more uh, questions from the Zoom, uh, both about translation. Um, so the first comes from uh, Otkon Bayar, um, who asks, um, do you know of any further uh, or any other English translations of Jangar? That would be the first. And then the second, uh, once again from Dolma, uh, uh, asks, was your translation done directly from Todo Bichig or was it intermediated by the Russian? How did you negotiate potential discrepancies mm -hmm. across records? So this is a book that I use for my translation. And um, it was um, published in 1990. And uh, it has two texts uh, in, in Kalmyk and in Russian. So, um, so there are different layers of translation. And, uh, and of course, my translation is not perfect. And I just, just wanted to get it out so people can learn about this tradition. Uh, so what, um, so, so there are different level of understanding the language. So uh, what was exciting, uh, you, can, you, can, you can translate the words on a, um, on a first level. But then you can, if you have more time, you can just get lost in time. Because you can, you can look for different layers of the meaning. Um, so and then you, you find this, um, you, you find this uh, amazing, um, amazing meaning, right? So uh, apparently, ah, so when you translate and then uh, you, you find the name, especially like geographic names, I think because they were nomads, so they knew this uh, like precise location and the name of every hill and mountain and river. So first when I was translating, you can just translate as like white ice mountain, or I also decided to Google map. And I just put the names from the Kalmyk. And then I discovered that, oh my god, these are the names actually still exist somewhere in, in the Altai region, in, um, uh, in, uh, in the Caucasus. So, uh, so there are different levels of translation. So, and if you use not only the Kalmyk language, but the Kalmyk archaic language. You can get a completely different level of translation. So, 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 so and that's what makes this epic um, uh, uh, a treasure, that there are different layers of time, there are different layers of understanding. Um, so, so my translation, of course, it's just like still on this superficial level, but there, are, there yeah, there should be, there will be more studies that would get into the depths of time and um, and and concept what it is to be in that time or without time. Are there any other lingering questions? Um, that may be an excellent spot to end today's um, talk. Uh, please join me once again in thanking our speaker, Professor Bagdaeva. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us here in Weiser Hall or online through Zoom. Uh, I hope to see many of you back here uh, in two days' time for the roundtable of uh, women artists from Ukraine responding to the war. Thank you very much. <laughs>